So dear colleagues, good morning. My name is Ariadne Malamiti Puchner and I am professor of pediatrics and neonatology in the University of Athens and a local organizer of this Hippocrates seminar. With my colleagues, the two that you can see there, Dr. Theodora Butsiku and Dr. Despina Briana. So please show yourselves there. Uh, uh, we welcome you to this Hippocrates Seminar in Athens, in the historic city of Athens. And uh, we all three are here to help you to solve any problems concerning the seminar, yeah? And so please don't hesitate if you have questions respectively. Now, just for historic reasons, I would like to say that I was one of the few founders of the Hippocrates Seminars 31 years ago. And um, actually, Professor George Simbruna, who is the instigator and founder of uh, Hippocrates Seminars, started his first seminar in his farmhouse in a village, in a small village in Lower Austria called Thürnleis. And the first seminar that we attended was science writing seminar with Professor Mimi Zeiger from uh, the University of San Francisco. Now, although this is a very nostalgic memory, we can admit that uh, things have changed considerably since that time. So we, th we hope to offer you a state-of-the-art seminar in a hall with the most impressive view and very close to the most important monuments of Athens. And now having said that, I would like to tell you that this evening after the seminar, a guided tour to the New Acropolis Museum is going to take place for the faculty. But I have asked the uh, guide whether some people from our group could join this tour. And she told me that she can cope with 40 people, up to 40 people. So the, fac the foreign uh, participants, including the faculty, are 30. And if they want to participate to this guided tour, uh, they have to give their names to my colleagues at the break. The entrance to the museum is five euros, and everyone has to pay that at the entrance to the museum. So if you are interested to go, please give your names. And now for my Greek colleagues, I'm sure that they have visited this exquisite museum several times, but if every, somebody wants to revisit it, please give your name also during the break. <coughs> A very important information is that uh, in your folders, you have a, an evaluation sheet. You have to fill it up and give it before the lunch break on Sunday. Everybody has to give this. And Professor Simbrunner is very, he asked me several times not to forget to say that and not to, you to forget to give it. So please do it before the break um, in, uh, on Sunday, the lunch break on Sunday. So I, I hope that you will have a very nice, very promising seminar, it is this one. And I hope that you will enjoy Athens despite the current not so flourishing political and economical situations. Thank you. Good morning. I also want to welcome you, uh, and I certainly appreciate all the uh, hospitality that we've had so far from uh, Ariadne and uh, the other organizers. This is uh, not a very easy thing to put together, so uh, a you know, tremendous amount of uh, effort, which is really appreciated. Uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, give you a little bit of a background of um, Hippocrates. Uh, uh, Ariadne already gave you a little bit of a background, but uh, uh, I want to uh, let you know what Hippocrates stands for. Uh, and this is a picture of uh, Professor Simbrunner. Uh, Hippocrates is the International Postgraduate Organization for Knowledge Transfer Research and Teaching Excellent Students. Uh, this organization started a little bit over 30 years ago, 31 years ago, and uh, as was just mentioned, it started in a little farm just outside of Vienna, Austria, a little bit north of Vienna, Austria, in a town called Dernleis. I, I had the opportunity to visit Dernleis uh, this uh, past August. 
and it's a town of about 500 people. And uh, you can just imagine, you know, very, very tiny farming village uh, outside of a, a, a big city. And when uh, uh, Professor Simbrunner initially uh, thought of Hippocrates, his, his idea was to be able to uh, bring people together, people who did not have opportunities to uh, meet with uh, professors from other places. At that time, there was a wall between East and West. And uh, a lot of people from Central Europe and Eastern Europe did not have the opportunities to, uh, to meet with people from Western Europe or the United States or England. And so this was his dream, to, uh, to be able to bring people together. And so he started this conference in his little farmhouse and uh, invited Mimi Zeiger. And uh, Mimi was a, a person from a very famous institute, uh, uh, the Cardiovascular Research Institute in uh, San Francisco. And the story is that when she first got there, she looked around and she realized what she was getting into. There's a farmhouse with pigs and uh, realized that, gosh, this is, this is really different. She was used to speaking in uh, you know, fancy hotel rooms and uh, not speaking outdoors to, uh, to people. But uh, um, Professor Simbrenner's wife uh, cooked a very nice dinner for her and uh, she showed a lot of hospitality and Mimi Z uh, Zeiger ended up coming eight years after uh, every year for eight years after for, for conferences. And so uh, this is a slide that shows uh, the uh, uh, growth of Hippocrates over the years. And you can see in the 1980s, very small, and then uh, in the mid-1990s really began to grow. And over the last couple of years, you can see 2010, there were over 30 Hippocrates conferences. And Hippocrates has spread from this uh, very little uh, farmhouse to uh, being worldwide. And just the new venues since 2005 to 2011 include these countries here. You can see Russia, Spain, Hong Kong, India, Turkey, Portugal, many countries including uh, Africa, uh, Middle East. We've been going to uh, a lot of different places and we plan to expand even more to, uh, to other places. Uh, so the organization has grown tremendously. Last year, we, uh, we had a, uh, a, a meeting in the island of Kos. And Kos is the island where the uh, uh, father of medicine, Hippocrates, was born. And uh, we had a little ceremony. And you can see these are some of the uh, uh, organizers uh, of the uh, uh, Hippocrates conferences. And uh, uh, this is uh, the uh, ceremony that we had to, uh, to uh, honor the 30th anniversary of the organization. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background of what Hippocrates is. And uh, now I'm going to get into our conference over the next three days. And the uh, conference is uh, Neonatal Nutrition and Gastroenterology. And uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, spend about 20 minutes or so to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the areas that we are going to be discussing. When we talk about nutrition in the neonate, this actually starts considerably before a baby is born, before a mother even conceives. And I'm sure you're very well aware of the story of uh, folic acid. Uh, folic acid is a vitamin that uh, when given to, uh, uh, to mothers uh, uh, pre-conceptually actually can prevent neural tube defects, and encephaly, major, major problems. Nutrition in fetal life is very important. What a mother eats during fetal life is very important. When we start seeing babies being born prematurely, and we see here 23 weeks gestation, uh, this is the area that we are really going to focus a lot on in this conference, very preterm babies. And then we'll also talk a little bit about uh, the step-down period and post-hospital discharge. Some of the issues that we have in neonatal intensive care and uh, neonatal nutrition pertain to when we should start feeding babies. Should we start feeding babies right after they're born? if they're on a ventilator, if they have umbilical artery lines in place, how do we feed these babies and what do we feed these babies? 
we need to talk about the effect on development, especially the brain. The developing GI tract, we're beginning to uh, uh, find out that the uh, gastrointestinal tract is much more than just a feeding tube. It's the largest immune organ of the body. It plays many, many roles, and I think you'll develop a better appreciation for this very exciting organ during this, uh, this conference. We're also going to talk a little bit about the intestinal microbiome. It seems like this is a newly discovered organ in, uh, in our bodies, the microbes that live within us. This is a, a very exciting area that uh, plays a large role in terms of uh, diseases, not only in the neonate, but beyond. Then we'll talk about some special conditions such as surgical infants, necrotizing enterocolitis, early nutrition programming, and metabolic syndrome. And we'll talk about how to do research in some of these areas. Okay, so here we have a 27-week appropriate for gestational age baby. When I first was a resident in the mid-1970s, a baby like this, weighing less than 1,000 grams, we would usually just uh, place to the side of the neonatal intensive care unit, give a little bit of uh, comfort care, uh, keep the baby warm, and the baby would, would usually die. It's very unusual to have a baby that's greater than 26, 27 weeks gestation die. But we have a lot of problems with these babies in terms of their neurodevelopment. And what we do in terms of nutrition for these babies is extremely important. We have some problems in terms of our common practices in nourishing preterm babies. As far as enteral feedings through the gastrointestinal tract, we frequently delay enteral feedings for long periods of time. We introduce parenteral nutrition, intravenous nutrition, very slowly, sometimes over a period of one to two weeks. And this is a time when the infant is also highly stressed and highly vulnerable to nutritional deficiencies. We need to look at nutrition differently than we have in the past. We have to start to look at nutrition as an emergency in the neonatal period in these babies. Here we see a graph that looks at fetal growth in the 50th percentile and 10th percentile. And this is actually how we are doing. We're not doing that well. A lot of these babies are not even reaching the 10th percentile when they are discharged from the neonatal intensive care unit. So we are actually creating extra uterine growth restriction. You will be hearing about the fetus as a model for extra uterine nutrition and growth. How we can match nutrition in the uh, preterm baby to the nutrition that that baby would be getting if that baby was still in utero. We need to recognize the fact that the energy stores in these preterm babies is very low. If you look at the uh, uh, babies born at 24 and 26 weeks gestation, and if you look at their lipid content, 0.1 and 1.5 percent, their energy is very low. Their energy content is very low, 19.5 kilocalorie stored or 123.6 kilocalories stored for a 26-week preterm. So these babies cannot last very long without us providing nutrition for them. Is nutrition really an emergency in these babies? When we look at the brain and the development of the brain from 25 weeks gestation to term, there's a marked change that occurs. And the nutrition that we give to these babies plays a major role in development of this brain. Just to give you an uh, example, work that was done at Brown University uh, by Dr. Bohr's group did a retrospective study of 124 extremely low birth weight infants 
and looked at them at 18 months in terms of their neurodevelopment. And here we see MDI at 18 months and the first week of amino acid intake and the first week of energy intake. This is during the first week. For every one gram of protein increment, of amino acid increment, for every one gram extra that that baby is getting at 18 months, that baby has an 8.2 increment in the developmental index. For each 10 calories per kilo per day increment, at 18 months, that baby has a 4.6 point increment in MDI, developmental index. So what we feed these babies early on is extremely important in terms of their neurodevelopment. A small amount, even in just that first week, can make a big difference. What about the gastrointestinal tract? As I mentioned, it's the largest immune organ of the body. It harbors a huge microbial ecosystem, which we are finding to be very important. It harbors the enteric nervous system. The number of neurons and the size of the enteric, uh, 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 enteric nervous system is equal to that of our spinal cord. Huge, huge nervous tissue in our gastrointestinal tract. Very exciting organ. The intestinal surface area grows markedly. Even though the intestine as a tube is, uh, uh, grows from about 100 centimeters to about 200 centimeters, uh, the small intestine grows from about 100 centimeters to 200 centimeters during that last trimester of pregnancy, the growth in surface area is remarkable. The surface area of the intestine, because of the villus surface area and the microvillus surface area in an adult is around 200 square meters. The skin surface area, our skin surface area, is only 1.6 square meters. So the intestine has a huge, huge surface area. And that surface area of the intestine is exposed to a huge, quantity of microbes and a huge quantity of food antigens. There is only one layer of epithelial cells that is covered by a mucus coat that separates the internal milieu, the lumen of the gastrointestinal tract, from a very immunoreactive submucosa. This is an area that we will talk about. And you will find that uh, the gut is the motor that drives systemic inflammation. Very important point to remember. The permeability of the intestine, if the uh, uh, intestine breaks down, if it becomes leaky, if the membranes break down, or if the tight junctions between epithelial cells break down, you have a relationship to numerous diseases. These include some of our neonatal diseases, such as necrotizing enterocolitis, hospital-acquired late-onset sepsis. Later on, we see celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, type 1 diabetes, atopic diseases, and even autism has been related to a leaky gastrointestinal tract. As I mentioned before, it seems like we discovered a new organ in the gastrointestinal tract in our bodies called the, uh, uh, the microbiome. And this started because of the Human Genome Project, which was initiated in the uh, uh, late 1980s and took around 13 years uh, for the uh, uh, human adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine uh, sequence to be uh, uh, discovered. With all the technological advances in the Human Genome Project, we were able to take some of these uh, technological advances and apply them to the microbial 
DNA sequences. And uh, with this, we have found that in our gastrointestinal tract, there's a whole new world. If we just culture the microbes in our gastrointestinal tract and work very hard to culture the microbes in our gastrointestinal tract, we might find around 400 species. But if we use these new sequencing technologies, we find nearly 2,000 what are called operational taxonomic units, similar to species. So this is a whole new world. We find that 70% uh, of the microbes in our gastrointestinal tract have not been cultivatable in the past. How do the, some of these microbes relate to our health and disease? The early development of the microbes we're beginning to find plays a huge role in health and disease. We'll be discussing that. We're also going to be discussing a little bit about programming and how that relates to some of the uh, uh, public health problems that we see. In the United States, obesity has rapidly overtaken smoking as our number one public health problem. And uh, this costs approximately $120 billion a year. And we're beginning to find that uh, this obesity epidemic is not just in the United States. It's also in many other countries. And it's related to metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome includes atherosclerosis, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. There are some countries, such as India, if you look closely here, right now the incidence of type 2 diabetes in India is around 31.7 per 1,000. In the year 2050, it's expected to be 79.4 per 1,000. Huge, huge increase in type 2 diabetes. We're seeing the same kind of increase in many countries in the world. The United States alone is, is, is really not alone in terms of obesity and its teenagers. Here we see the United States and uh, obesity in the teenagers in the United States. And here we see some other countries. You see Greece is coming very close. Is this due to eating too much? Well, I'm sure that that plays a major, major role. But we now have this uh, hypothesis called the Barker hypothesis, or the uh, uh, thrifty phenotype or fetal origins hypothesis, where prenatal undernutrition leads to metabolic adaptations, where you have a mismatch between predicted and actual environments. And that is thought to lead to uh, uh, some of these problems. The mechanisms are not very well understood but it's thought that there are some epigenetic mechanisms that may be involved here. And by epigenetic mechanisms, we are not talking about the adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine sequence of DNA. We are talking about the proteins that the DNA wraps around and how these proteins interact with the environment to open up areas of DNA that will allow for transcription of RNA to occur. Okay, this is a, a totally new area, and uh, uh, I think that we'll just be referring to that a little bit later. And then we'll be talking about some of the diseases that we see in preterm babies. And certainly we're going to focus on uh, uh, the uh, probably the most dreaded and hated uh, disease in, uh, in the neonate, and that's classic necrotizing enterocolitis. So I think that with that introduction I'd like to begin, and uh, Dr. Bill Hay will give the first lecture. Uh, to 